Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us today. Welcome to this Informatica webinar. My name is Prashchandra Mohan and with me today is Leslie Hanley, Senior Director of Product Management at Informatica. We are thrilled about this topic. Identity resolution is at the heart of every mass data management solution. It is one of the key capabilities and often a hot topic of discussion among practitioners as well as data management leaders like you. With hype around AI, machine learning, this topic has become especially important these days. So we wanted to talk about this today. There are many challenges associated with identity resolution, and we wanted to simplify some of this for you and take you on a short journey where we will examine this topic in a little bit deeper level. We will explore the common challenges associated with the identity resolution, various approaches that exist today in the market, and where some of these methodologies fall short. If done right, identity resolution can help organizations in many ways. It can help achieve better faster analytics and insights by identifying conflicting and redundant customer information. It can reduce the time and effort needed for data stewards by improving the accuracy of automated merging process. It's very critical uh, if you're constantly adding new data sources. It can also accelerate return on investment and simplify and automate accurate regulatory compliance reporting. At the end of this webinar, we'll also share with you our approach here at Informatica and how it is helping organizations around the world in their mastery data management initiatives. Let's start with a quick introduction. We are lucky to have Leslie Hanley, as I said before, from product management at Informatica. Leslie, uh, can you give us a brief introduction about yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks, Prash. Hi, everybody. Um, as Prash said, I head up um, MDM product management for um, a couple of our different product lines, and my team is responsible for the prioritization of features for our match engine, um, as well as for multi-domain MDM, and our big data solution, Relay360. Excellent. Thank you, Leslie. And my name is Prash Mohan, and I'm the Director of Product Marketing here at Informatica. I've been in this NDM space for about 13 years where I worked with uh, many organizations like yours and I'm also working currently as a product marketer here at Informatica. In my prior role as a solution architect, I helped many organizations um, in their master data management initiatives. I believe MDM can help some of the complex business challenges companies organizations face today. And if you've done right, this can help you immensely in your any business-led initiative. Few housekeeping items before we proceed. If your colleagues missed this webinar or you want to share this with someone in your organization or otherwise, uh, the on-demand version will always be available in the same URL. It will take about an hour to get ready after this webinar completes, so please make sure you share this URL with your colleagues who are not able to attend today. We have a number of downloads for you from the attachment section. Uh, specifically, we would love for you to download the white paper we created on data matching in MDM. It provides you a deep dive analysis and I think will be extremely helpful to you in your next um, uh, vendor selection. And finally, uh, you can ask a question at any point in time using the questions window on the right side of your screen. Drop your question as you have it and we will go uh, and get to that at the end of this um, presentation from Leslie and we will answer as many questions as possible today. And the last thing, the Bright Talk works on your internet connection, so sometimes if you have a bad network or a voice may be breaking in, it's probably because the network is, is not good enough. So please make sure um, you bear that in mind. If you have any challenges, please refresh your screen or get to a better network, and that should help you uh, hear us clearly. So with that, I would like to hand it over to um, my awesome colleague, Leslie. And Leslie, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thanks, Fresh. All right, so let me just take you through uh, briefly what we're going to cover today. We're going to start by talking about some of the challenges of identity resolution. And then I'm going to cover some of the things that people typically try in order to address this problem um, and what some of the, the, the issues are with those common techniques. And then we're going to talk about how Informatica approaches this and, and what our search, uh, how our search match engine works. Um, and then Prash will come back and give you some more information on where to get more info. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end, as Prash said, for Q&A. So without any further ado, let's just get started with some of the challenges. So no matter what type of organization you work for,
Leslie, is it just me or did I lose you? Oh boy. Hmm. Um, looks like we did lose Leslie. So let me give her a quick buzz here um, to get her back online. Hello. Yes, you're back. Lost, <laughs> lost <laughs> Leslie there for a while. <laughs> so, Prash, what were you saying about internet connections? Uh, it turns out mine was not ideal, and I just got dropped off the call. I'm so sorry about that, everybody. Um, let me carry on with where we were started. So, I started off saying um, that no matter what type of organization you work for, uh, whether it is a uh, public sector organization or a private sector organization, um, your organization has goals that it needs to achieve in order to be successful. So if you work in the public sector, your organization's goals are typically to provide the best service possible with the money allocated. That could mean that you need to have a clear picture of who you're providing services to before you can actually um, uh, make sure that the citizens receiving those services are the right people for the services. You need to have a reliable way to screen people that are arriving at your country's port of entry to make sure they're not on watch lists for terrorists and other criminal or undesirable parties. You need to be able to find as much information as possible about a suspect um, if you're in law enforcement before your officers of the law interact with that suspect. Or you need to be able to keep track of the great trade goods that are flowing across your borders in order to be able to enforce import and export regulations. Um, and you also need to be able to keep track of things like patents or trademarks in order to avoid disputes. So in other words, you need reliable data about people, organizations, and goods. Now, if you work in the private sector, your organization's goals are typically about how best to increase profitability um, and beat your competitors. And in order to do that, and to, in order to be able to grow your business, you need a reliable picture of what your goods and services are and which are the most profitable before you can figure out how to balance your portfolio to improve profitability. You also need to have a reliable picture of who you're selling to and what you're selling to them before you can figure out how to sell them more. Um, and you need to be able to have a reliable picture of who you're buying from and what you're buying from them before you can figure out how to streamline your costs by finding economies of scale or streamlining your supply chain. You also need to understand where your areas of risks are so that before you can actually be able, before you're actually able to reduce risks. And you need to make sure that your business doesn't fall foul of the regulations that govern your industry or broader uh, regulations such as GDPR. In other words, you also need reliable data about customers, suppliers, and products. But the problem is that good data can be hard to find. Um, the challenge isn't with your transactional data. Organizations are usually, if they remain in business, they're usually good at logging their transaction data. In other words, knowing how much um, a transaction for, was for and when it took place. The problem is usually with reliably identifying who you transacted with and for what often. Um, so in other words, the problem is in your master data. So I'm gonna, I've got a fake invoice here. This isn't a real one, it's just to demonstrate. Um, but I wanna look at the master data problem for, for my illustrating company here. Um, and from this transaction record, uh, InfoWidget company knows that they sold a um, uh, Mrs. M. Reyes Hernandez, a uh, certain number of widgets, and they know where to contact her because, because they have her phone number. But now they want to actually start to uh, look at what other business they've done with her in order to decide if she should qualify for a special promotion, for example. So the logical place to go is to their CRM system. And they don't actually find Mrs. M. Reyes Hernandez uh, with the spelling that they have in the order form um, in the CRM system even though there actually is a record for that person in their CRM system. It just doesn't look exactly the same. So let's highlight some of the differences. Um, we've got things like the a full first name uh, in CRM instead of just the initial. Uh, the first part of the double barrel surname, however, has been taken out incorrectly as a middle name in CRM and abbreviated. And the last name has some uh, spelling differences as well. And 
well, the phone numbers might look the same at first glance. The last two digits are actually transposed. Now, you and I look at this, and at a glance, we, just, we can decide that these are probably two records for the same person. But the thing is that human beings are incredibly good at discerning patterns and making inferences and applying experiences to reach a decision. But computers aren't. Even with all the recent advances that we've had in artificial intelligence and machine learning, it can take a huge amount of training time and training data and testing of algorithms by a person before a computer can do what we just did in a glance. What a computer needs are intelligent rules and algorithms to help it to find similar records and then to determine if those are likely to uh, the same records for the same person. We're going to come back to intelligent rules and algorithms for finding and matching data a little bit later in this webinar. One of the things that actually makes managing master data so difficult um, without a good master data management solution is that organizations typically have lots and lots of different IT systems. And each of them typically has variations of that master data as well. So if I have some, uh, a look at some more examples of the types of data variation, variation you can get in different names, um, you'll notice in this example we've got just four systems. In many of our customers, they have many, many more than just four systems of, of data where their master data resides. I'm going to highlight just a few differences between the data in each of these systems. You'll notice that there are differences in spelling of names. There are differences in the amount of information that's available for things like addresses. Um, and there are even differences in things like uh, the date of birth, which uh, in, it looks like the, the, the month and the date have been transposed there. So you'll notice that there are a lot of different types of variation in, in the spellings, the level of data available, and in the way that that data has been entered. Now, sorry, why is this world going? Okay. I'm going to give you a few more examples of the types of problems that we commonly see in data. Um, I'm going to focus just on person names as the example, because believe me, just in person names, there are enough variations and, and issues that we could talk about this for a long time. But let me just click through quickly some of the typical types of errors we see. We see errors in concatenation of names. Um, we see different, nick, uh, different variations of nicknames for the same name. So, uh, Jack and Johnny are both nicknames for John, for example. Lots of variations in the uh, the spelling of names. Uh, some of it correct, some of it incorrect. Uh, we see language variations across names as well. You see misspellings because of phonetically similar names. So this is one that I always have a problem with when I hear North American accents. I can't, can't tell if people are saying Craig or Greg very often. Um, you see spelling uh, variations in last names. You see um, suffix variations in different ways that suffixes are, are taken down. In some cases, they're missing entirely. Uh, mistyping, of course, uh, this is one that I have a, a huge problem with typing the word John correctly without spelling it with an I. Um, Anglicization of names. So um, this is uh, from a colleague of mine. Uh, his name in Chinese is presented one way. It gets anglicized as either Wu Gang or Gang Wu. Or, of course, he has an anglicized name as well. So uh, different character sets and anglicization of names. Uh, name order often gets mixed up. Um, you see variations in the way that initials are represented. Um, and then also um, mixtures of how titles and credentials are included with names. Um, and then another thing is, is the, the example that I had with Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Reyes Hernandez with different ways of handling hyphenations of uh, uh, hyphenated last names. So lots of variations in, uh, in names. And it's not just person names that have this. You find similar and actually sometimes worse variations in things like company names, product descriptions, addresses, location descriptions, URLs, email addresses, and so on. So with all this variation, and frankly mess in our master data, how do we ever make identity data relevant and actionable? So to do that, what your organization needs to be able to do, if I go back to my, exa my example that I had earlier of the, the different systems, what you need to be able to do is to tie all of the data that you have, uh, tie together all of the data you have from the various systems. Um, and in many cases, what you're trying to do is to create a single trusted authoritative record for each of those entities. Um, and what that requires is intelligent data matching that can identify the data for use by pulling it from multiple systems, compensate for the many formats that the data might be in, and also take into account the errors and, and variations in that data. 
So people tend to talk about this as uh, data deduplication, or very often they talk about it as data matching. Um, and let's look at what's actually involved in dealing with that duplicated and inconsistent data intelligently. Um, we, we do ourselves a little bit of a disservice if we talk about this as a data matching problem, because actually there are two things you need to do well in order to be able to resolve identity. You need to be able to search well, and you need to be able to match the data well. Now why search? So I'm going to use a, a needle in a haystack analogy for this. Uh, imagine that you need to find a tiny needle in a haystack like this. Um, if you had to examine every piece of straw in that haystack to decide if it's a needle or not, it's going to take you forever. What you need to be able to do first is narrow down the examination to just the most likely areas of that haystack um, to get your results much faster. And that's really the job of search. The job of search is to rapidly find the smallest appropriate set of possible matches. And I've highlighted the keywords rapidly here and appropriate, because what you're wanting to do is, as quickly as possible, get a set of records that your match can do the examination on. Um, but you want to not bring in matches, uh, possible candidates that really are, um, are, are going to cause your match engine to have to do too much work. So you want to bring it down to the smallest appropriate set of possible matches. Speed is obviously important um, because your end users need to be able to get answers quickly. Um, but really what you're balancing is speed and thoroughness of, of searching of that data. You want to be able to have high performance for identifying valid matches and limiting false matches, even under the pressure of real-time queries very often because many of our, our customers are enterprises that are using their master data management system in operational real-time use cases where there is an end user that is, is being identified at the point um, at, at, in a real-time way. Um, but you have to be able to do that. Um, you have to be able to have the flexibility to also make sure that you're doing a comprehensive or thorough enough um, search, depending on your use case. Um, so whatever, whatever solution you have has to be able to give you that balance between speed and comprehensiveness. Um, so for example, if your organization is an insurance company and you're searching against a list of, of deaths in a country to, de to determine any of, if any of the life insurance policies that you have need to be paid out, then you're going to want to search much more carefully and thoroughly than you would if you were doing if maybe you're a retailer who's running an email marketing campaign, where speed of getting the matching data far outweighs the need to ensure that all matches are 100% correct. So the stakes are different, and you need to be able to balance according to, to what your stakes in matching are. And once you've searched for that data and you have a set of candidate matches, um, if I carry my needle in a, a haystack analogy a little bit further, so let's go back to our needle. Um, once you've found a set of candidates for matching, um, then you need to be able to examine each of those carefully to determine which of them are actually matches for what you searched for. So matching is the process of comparing records at a very detailed level to, to determine which are actually matches. So you can see why you need both the search and the match to be able to do their jobs well in order to be able to resolve identity. So now that we've talked a little bit about what the challenges are with resolving identity in master data. I want to take you through some common approaches that people have, have tried um, in order to um, resolve identities um, and also then just talk about what some of the shortcomings are of each of those techniques. Sorry, this is a little bit slow to move forward. All right. So the first of these that I want to talk about is text search. Um, this is actually a surprisingly common approach to data matching, and it's actually quite an absurd approach to data matching. Um, it's quite frankly the thing that leads to much of the duplication that we see in, um, in many of our systems today. The idea here is that you're doing a, an exact text search or a, a SQL-like um, a wildcard search, um, and I'll talk about Lucy in a bit. In, in a bit. Um, but that kind of SQL-like search, that's either doing an exact match or a, a search on, on a part of a word. 
And the, the, the mistake that people often make is thinking that if you find an exact match, you found the right record. And that's not necessarily true. It's not even necessarily true that an exact match is a better match than one that has some variation in it. The real, the real point of the search is to find the records that could practically be considered a match um, or to find all the, the candidates that a user could believe are the same person. And that's not what you're going to find if you're doing an exact text search. So more recently, some people have, have uh, some companies have started to try to use some of the uh, Lucene-based full-text search engines, so things like Elasticsearch or Solar Search, to search for matches. But the thing is that just because two things are called search doesn't mean that they serve the same purpose, and that a full-text search engine um, is actually the right approach to take for for searching for matches. The th think about this: your full-text search engine is is designed to search web pages and documents. Um, and to let a user find a word or phrase anywhere within the database or within the document. And the key word there is user. Full text search engine really is designed to return a ranked list of as many results as possible to a user who will then drill down on the results. Now, if, you know, if you think of how you search for something in Google, for example, you don't care how many pages of results come back as long as what you find what you're looking for on the first page or two. Otherwise, you're going to go back and add in additional search uh, terms in order to, to filter down your search. But I imagine if you try to use that to find, try and find match candidates, your match process is going to have to go through a huge number of irrelevant candidates. So what you need instead are selection techniques that overcome the error and variation in data so you don't want to be too restrictive in your, in your searches. But you also uh, want to make sure that you are finding good candidates um, and uh, that you're not being too imprecise in your searches for things like the Lucene-based full-text search. So we'll come back to that when we get to Informatica's search match um, engine selections techniques a little later. One of the other um, techniques that uh, is quite commonly used is, is the concept of a match code. Now, what a match code is, um, is an entity key essentially that's built from a combination of the entity's attributes. So I've included an example here um, where you can see that the match code Smith J 79 ny has been constructed from the last name, the initial of first name, last two digits of the year of birth, and a state code. Now, match codes can be very fast, assuming that uh, the data that you have is very clean and very consistent. Um, and they're really only of, of use if they're actually built using unique identifiers, so you actually really get back records that are definitely a match. And if you have no variation in your, in your data, um, the data has to be clean and accurate for these to work. And as we've already seen, really what are the chances of that? Now, something that I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with are, are what we call phonetic stabilization algorithms. Um, these are things that seem to overcome some of the challenges of text search and match codes uh, because they're actually built to allow for variations in spelling based on phonetic similarity between words. Um, I'm pretty sure you've most people would have heard of SoundX. You might have heard of NISIS as well, the New York State Identification Intelligence System, and then various um, uh, ver iterations of the Metaphone algorithm as well. Now, phonetic stabilization algorithms absolutely do have a part to play in identity resolution. But the choice of the right algorithm is critical and must be based on things like the distribution of the error and variation in data. This is something at Informatica, we've, we've conducted many evaluation exercises on data from many different customers in many different verticals or, or, or sectors and many different countries over the years. And what we found is that even in one country, um, for one particular type of data, there's no single algorithm that is optimal for, uh, for every type of the variation in that data. Fundamentally, the choice of the optimum word stabilization algorithm depends on the type of the data you're dealing with, the source of that data, is it input through uh, directly from end users, is it something that's coming in where somebody's taking uh, information from over the phone, is it information that's been captured from, uh, from uh, paper-based forms. All of those things impact the, the types of variation that you see in the data. Um, and then also the frequency distribution of classes of error in the data. Um, 
and then, for example, the, the types of variation that you get in business names as well is quite different from the types of variation that you see in person names. Um, and then the variation those differ from country to country as well. So typically, these, these phonetic stabilization algorithms, you need to make sure that you're picking the right one for the type of data you're working with. Um, because if you don't, you're going to end up with too many false positives. Um, and also, the other thing to bear in mind is that most of these are written to deal with English phonetic um, uh, uh, variations. There are a few variations of these for different languages, but really not that many. Um, and you have to be able to uh, think about the, the variations across all the different languages you might need to deal with. Another popular technique is something um, that we call string similarity algorithms. Uh, these are really uh, really come at the problem of data errors from another angle. What they're trying to account for are, thing, are, are keyboarding errors, so things like transposition of characters or hitting adjacent keys in error. My mistyping of the word John, for example, is something that um, a string similarity algorithm would be able to tell me how similar these things uh, to, to um, two strings are. They, you've probably heard of Levenstein or the variations of the Levenstein edit distance algorithm, um, really what they're doing is comparing two strings and giving you a score on how similar they are. The trouble with these algorithms, though, is that they have absolutely no understanding of the context of the data. Um, so for example, just because two strings are somewhat similar in characters, it doesn't mean that they're similar in meaning. If I look at the examples that I have here on the screen, Emily and Emily have a Levenstein distance of two. Um, and yeah, probably they're, same, they're similar in meaning. They're, they're variations of the name Emily. But Junior and Senior also have a Levenstein distance of two. They differ from each other by two characters. But they mean something completely different from each other. And so the fact that, that, these, uh, that they have a Levenstein distance of two actually is irrelevant when it comes to searching and matching that, that data. Now, there are some newer techniques. Um, that you will see and you will hear a lot of people talking about um, uh, artificial intelligence for data deduplication. Um, and one of the ways that AI vendors try to convince people to buy their machine learning platforms and tools is by claiming that it's automated, that it's an automatic way of uh, really uh, replacing data, the work that data scientists do. Um, in this age of data and digital transformation, data scientists are in high demand and in short supply. Um, so something that sounds like it will replace the need for data scientists can sound quite appealing. The problem is that the skills that data scientists possess are actually hard to automate. And the people who uh, seek to buy so-called automated AI should be aware of exactly what can be automated and what can't with present technology. In many real-world situations, you still need lengthy data ex exploration and some domain-specific knowledge in order to select the right algorithms and to actually put together the right training data in order to train your machine learning, um, your machine learning algorithms. So, in order for them to actually learn, they need something that is that they can learn on. Um, there is absolutely a place for machine learning and identity resolution, but it's not enough on its own. It needs to be combined with other powerful identity resolution techniques in order to ever be truly transformative. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So we've spoken about um, you know, what the challenges are. So let's talk about really what is needed for intelligent, reliable matching. Um, I've talked about many techniques that don't work at least not on their own. So let's talk about what, what really does work and what is needed. So what you need really are, firstly, you need algorithms that can cope with real-world data that is not formatted or cleansed, as well as data that includes all the variation and errors that, that we've spoken about. You need a rule base that combines out-of-the-box domain uh, appropriate rules that are built by data scientists that can be further customized to incorporate additional knowledge based on your specific data. Um, you need support for the um, phonetic and orthographic correct, corrections that are needed in order to address the spelling and typing errors that you find in data. You need intelligent matching routines that can be uh, weighted to mimic essentially an expert user's choice of attributes to identify correct matches, and that can be adapted to account for error and variation in those attributes. And then you need algorithms that work well regardless of the data's country of origin, the language, and that insulate you, uh, your end users, from the differences between country and language. Which brings us, of course, to Informatica's search match engine and how we approach this. So a couple of um, 
numbers about our search match engine. Uh, the rules and libraries that underpin our search match engine have been trained and enhanced um, over almost 30 years of solving data duplication problems in thousands of um, implementations in both the private and the public sectors. The engine itself has been enhanced over the years and has, um, has been updated to take on modern challenges such as searching and matching at scale in big data environments. The same search match engine is something that's really important to, to be aware of is um, the same search match engine is used across all of the Informatica products that have match related use cases. This includes multi-domain MDM, um, our data quality solution, customer 360 supply, 360 identity resolution, secure at source, which is um, uh, one of the latest places that we started to put the match engine in for subject re registry for GDPR compliance and then Relate360 and Big Data Quality for Big Data Matching. The other thing um, that I wanted to, to point out about this is that our certain match engine has country and language specific knowledge bases that account for the linguistic and phonetic, phonetic differences that you see by region. And we have over 60 of those out of the box. And we also have tools in order to build new populations or customized populations for your own specific data, uh, data profiles and data needs. But out of the box, what we include in here are probabilistic search strategies that include the name frequencies for each of those populations so that searches on common names are weighted differently from searches on uncommon names. And that's something that's really important to bear in mind. Um, Name frequency is an important consideration when you're dealing with search and match. I've got an, an example here of a random set of 100,000 records that we have with that from the US. Um, the words that we use to label things for names, for example, are chosen from a very different vocabulary than the words that we use in meaningful language. There are no dictionaries that tell you what the right spelling for a surname is, or spell checkers, or rules for the names of people, places, things, and even to some extent addresses. The vocabulary that we use, for, for example, for people's first names includes in excess of 2.5 million words in the US alone. However, as much as 80% of the population have names from as few as 500 words. So you can see you've got a massive variation in distribution of, of names. So your name search and matching systems have to work well at both ends of this extreme curve. It has to be able to perform for the uncommon names as well as for the very common names. And that's a difficult challenge if you think of a database, for example, of 100 million people that could contain 100,000 John Smiths or one Main Street records. Um, so take the name James Smith just as an example. Oops, let me just build that out. Uh, take the name James Smith as an example. In the US, there's a high frequency of people named James Smith. And that has to be reflected in the population rules um, that you use for searching and matching. However, you're dealing with data in China. James Smith has low frequency of, of occurrences. And so the, the rules in the Chinese population would reflect that and would, counter, would um, cater for the names in China that are more um, uh, uh, that are closer to that. In the U.S., because of the high frequency in the U.S. population, you're going to build very tight keys and ranges to limit the number of candidates returned during a search to the things that are very close to James Smith. But because of its low frequency in the Chinese populations, we can afford to broaden our keys and ranges so a great amount of vari variation can be returned in the searching, and then the match rules take, um, take uh, that into account as well. So, Let's talk about how we actually do search and matching. Um, and I'm going to, I'll talk about search first, and we'll go into to the, uh, the approaches that we use for matching. OK, so there are two important parts to searching. One is being able to build indexes and keys to cut through the error and variation that you have in identity data, regardless of whether it's be cleaned or formatted or not, so that you have a smart fast index to help you to find match candidates. So out of the box, our search uh, match engine provides different levels of keying. Um, you can have different, you can, do, you can configure this up front um, to use either extended keys, for example, so if we have critical search needs and you want to bring in a broader set of data, so for example, an immigration officer who's checking a traveler against a terrorist and criminal watch list you want to be able to make sure that you're being thorough. So this is, remember what I spoke about earlier, about being able to balance um, thoroughness versus speed. You also have the option of more limited keys, which is, uh, is going to give you uh, a smaller set of potential uh, matches and uh, give you a much more well-defined um, and smaller index as well. 
So the algorithms that we use to build our keys are designed to provide efficient access um, and also actually are designed to do that even for common names. So we balance together the, the smart indexing with giving you multiple search strategies as well. The search strategy has to balance the conflicting objectives of making sure it doesn't miss possible candidates, but at the same time not slow the process with too many irrelevant candidates. So uh, let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So for example, if I'm searching for potential matches for John William Smith, um, and I choose the search strategy of typical, it's going to find names that have variations of, of John and Smith uh, together, for example, and maybe Smith and William together, and maybe John and William together. But if I use a more exhaustive, more extensive uh, uh, search strategy, um, it's going to bring in many more combinations of that, look combinations, for example, of the initials and uh, various different types of, of misspellings. So that at the end of the day, depending on what your search need is, it's going to give you either a bigger set of match candidates uh, for the match engine to evaluate or a more tightly defined set of match candidates. Again, balancing uh, speed uh, versus thoroughness. All right, on the matching side, um, we have, again, out of the box, um, high quality matching processes um, through the use of what we call match purposes. So what a match purpose is intended to do is to mimic the matching decisions that are made by your best business users or, or data scientists. It will really compare two records in detail, uh, typically your search record and a, and a file record, and then compute a score and give you a match decision um, at the end of that. So we give you out of the box different match purposes for different well, literally that match purposes. So for example, if you're wanting to match an individual um, versus somebody who's a, who's a resident at a particular location, the types of information that the match engine will, will consider can be different uh, depending on what the purpose is for which you're doing the match. In addition, we also give you ways to uh, either tighten up or loosen how, re how uh, restrictive the match engine is when it's comparing the records to match. So these are the match levels. So each match level will give you a different set of scores depending on whether you want the records to be very similar, highly similar to each other, or whether you can um, handle more variation in the, uh, in the data values that are, are provided for, for a particular match purpose. So we take these things together and um, come up with a score, and then based on the thresholds that are predefined in the rules, uh, we'll come back and tell you whether something is, is a match, so we've accepted it as a match, whether the system is undecided, it's in that sort of gray bucket, and then you can maybe put that through to a data steward to go and review and actually make a decision on, or whether the records are clearly not the same and it's rejected that match pair. So we spoke earlier about um, needing to provide intelligent rules, algorithms, intelligent routines to come up with the best match decision um, and to come up with that as fast as possible. Now, the way that we, just in summary, the way that we, we handle that within um, Informatics Search Match Engine is this combination of the standard population knowledge bases. Uh, together with match purposes, the smart indexing that we use and the, the search strategies that we use, and then giving you these different fine-tuning options for, um, for your match purposes and match levels and your search strategies, and at the end of that, putting that all together to come up with the best possible match decision um, and guidance back to your, your calling applications or your, your master data management solution as to whether two records are a match or not a match. But don't take my word for this. Um, Prash, I want, if you don't mind, can you just take us through some of the proof points that we have um, for our, the success of Informatica Search Match Engine? Sure. Thank you, Leslie. That's a great presentation. Um, so four years ago when I joined Informatica, it was, it was somewhat of an eye-opener for me, even though I was working in this space for a while, and, and to understand the depth of research and hard work goes into making um, this matching technique work and, and become efficient at that. As, as Leslie said, the engine behind Informatica's MDM that I actually designed um, was for, uh, for, for over 30 years of innovation behind it, and then combine that with uh, some of the things Leslie just talked about in terms of population, in terms of search strategies for apply, I think is what makes it a key um, differentiator for us. 
and and to just to um, show you how many customers are using over 1500 customers which includes some of the 50% fortune 500 companies use mdm solution today from informatica and and we continue to lead in in terms of customer loyalty scores uh, for dozen and a, dozens of years in a row now so I just want to give you a glimpse of what this means in terms of how customers are adopting it and how they're using it. Um, there's also the aspect that over 35 industries in, 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 in the world use this technology for a variety of different purposes. Uh, we also offer a flexible multi-domain MDM that is designed to manage any type of data. So identity data has been the key focus here, but we also manage a variety of different type of um, domains, as we call it in master data management space, using this technology. Uh, when I was doing just an inventory of all the domains which our customers are managing, we have an, uh, around 140 different domains uh, that customers manage today using MDM solution. We also believe that MDM must provide a great return on investment, and we have great examples of companies like Hyatt, Kmart, EMC, and others using to drive immense value out of their organization. You will see some of the logos here, which is only uh, scratching the surface. We have many uh, customers who leverage this, uh, the power of, power of our solution today. Uh, we also started, uh, one of the interesting things which happened ever since I came on board here four years ago was what we, what we call the 360 solution. We started offering these MDM powered solutions uh, such as customer 360, supplier 360, product 360, and relay 360. And, and we call them 360 solutions here. And they are designed to help um, implement MDM faster. As, as you guys know, some of you who have been in the space for a long time, implementing MDM and seeing that the return on investment used to be a longer time process in the, in the past, partly because of the technology challenges, partly because of the approach customers would take. But we put all those best practices, all those learnings we had over a period of you know, 15 to 20 years now in the space into something which customers can use to quick start and deploy faster. So um, that has been um, taken off really well. I, I would definitely recommend you guys to check out uh, some of our 360 solutions. And finally, a huge thank you to some of you joining us today who came up, um, came from our strong ecosystem of certified consultants. Uh, we have more than 20 uh, countries where you guys are playing. And, uh, and and thank you for uh, continue to the innovation. So what I wanted to do was uh, share some of the examples of, of what our customers are talking about it when it comes to the matching technology specifically. So again, I, I filtered down the course to focus on only the technology aspects. So uh, Weltbild is a, is a German publishing company and use our solution today. They were able to find the best results when they were optimizing from mailing campaign to a specific set of audience. Uh, we also have examples such as Transamerica here in North America who are using our technology or matching technology on large volumes of data. Uh, and in their case, it's, it's more than a billion records. Uh, and they want to use technology to identify overlaps between internal and external data sources, some of them coming from the cloud sources, some of them coming from external data providers. They want to see the overlap in the data between the externally sourced information as well as internally mastered um, customer data. So that is a very frequent thing which they need to do as part of campaign management process. And they are also additionally able to create household relationship using the same technology. So it kind of talks to you about um, the, the, the power of the solution uh, which they are leveraging today. And then we have um, customers like GE Capital. Many organizations have their customers in multiple different countries. They also have operations in different countries, which makes it really hard. Sorry about that. Which, which makes it really hard for organizations to apply matching and get best results when you have data from a variety of different countries stored in a single database. As, as Leslie mentioned, we, we take into account the variations due to language the country populations and subtle changes you see when you move from one region to the other region. Um, and, and you know, uh, the, the, the logic you apply to U.S. population may not work for uh, a Asian population or a population in India. So there are many variations we take into account before we uh, do the magic on that data. And GE Capital chose Informatica to help manage customer information um, uh, that was, uh, that was, that was, across many different countries 
and they wanted to leverage those international capabilities. They also said that the ease of integration with legacy system, which is, by the way, uh, every organization has today legacy information, was one of the other key reasons as well. And, and data matching is extremely critical in law enforcement and border control use cases as well, as, as Leslie was talking about at the very early part of her presentation. This is one of the key area of focus for us as well. A number of government organizations around the world, border control agencies, use Informatica Master Data Management to ensure their operations are, are faster and smoother, and at the same time, they are, they are ensuring that there is no um, a wrong person entering the country or, or um, the law enforcement is applied to the, to the right um, uh, scenario. So th this is one such example, Queensland Police Service in Australia. They were able to realize return on in Informatica investment in just two months. Uh, this is not a common thing you hear, um, especially in public sector where you know things take longer um, and, and you have a lot of complexity to deal with uh, when, when your data is siloed in. Um, a lot of uh, old um, systems and, uh, and technologies. So they were able to see uh, value from this investment within just two months. So what's really next for you guys? I think, um, first of all, I appreciate you taking time to join us today. Uh, we we want to continue our dialogue, dialogue with you. I, I hope this has been helpful. You should certainly download the matching white paper we created for you and, and get that um, from the attachment section here. You can um, get the PDF copy. And we also have um, a great news for you. So we have part two of this webinar, which is happening about a month from now. One of the U.S. federal agency uh, leverages Informatica solution to resolve close to 600 million personal uh, person-related re records. And, and these person-related records were spread across 11 uh, separate source systems uh, and, and, and comprising of around 30 plus years of immigration data. So they were able to master that information and, and resolve those identities, identities into just 180 million uh, um, uh, actual personal in, uh, identities. So that's a pretty amazing use case, and you can just imagine the the amount of efficiency, the amount of um, you know how, how good that company can get just by doing that. Uh, so we're going to share that story on uh, in November, so you can register to that right away, actually. The, the webinar has been set up. You can use the bit.ly uh, slash IR web, IR web meaning uh, identity resolution webinar too, uh, and you can use that link right away to register to that. So I'll give you a quick pause there so you can make sure you, you get that um, link right. And I really hope this, this webinar was very helpful to you. Um, we, we, we would like to bring in more uh, such stories for you, more such uh, technical in-depth um, uh, knowledge for you. So uh, we are hoping you can also rate us um, using uh, the feedback option here. So if you can rate us and provide your feedback, hopefully five star, uh, that will be really helpful for us so we can uh, design our next webinar based on your feedback. Uh, and and uh, and with that, uh, I would like to switch to the next screen where we will take some questions from you. And, uh, and uh, I do see some questions coming in as well already. Leslie, uh, should we focus on questions? Sure. Yeah, and I just want to mention that uh, we've been joined by two of our experts in data matching who have been involved in um, actually defining many of the population rules over the years as well. So we have Ray Shanley and uh, Lou De Silva on the line as well. So they're going to help me with uh, uh, answers to some of the questions that have come in. So guys, we have had some questions um, so far. Um, the first one, may, maybe Ray, you want to take this one. Um, the first one is about uh, data volumes. It says, what volumes of data do you support um, and what is, the, what is the match performance? Thanks, Leslie. <clears throat> so again, um, one of the things that has been happening over the years as, as the data volumes have exploded in the industry, um, the volumes of records that our customers need to match around their identity data and other entity type data has exploded with that. And as a result, we've continued to invest our in our technology to allow us to scale uh, with those volumes. One of the biggest challenges historically has been around um, scale and the ability to match at scale. It's one of those kind of challenges that um, is difficult to solve and requires a significant investment in R&D and, and um, technology investment, and that's something that Informatica continues to do. 
Um, one of the advancements in, in recent technology has been Hadoop, and Informatica has invested heavily in our identity management, identity resolution, and identity uh, technology uh, in that space in order to allow us to take match problems that typically took days to resolve um, and get those down into hours or minutes, um, depending on the scale of the Hadoop platform that you, that you can do it on. We've taken a problem that historically hasn't scaled horizontally, and by applying Hadoop technology, we've actually been able to get it to scale in a horizontal fashion. So you can actually apply as much uh, horsepower as you need to in order to solve those uh, difficult match challenges. Great. Thanks, Ray. Um, the second question that we have that's come through is the following. Um, so. Hopefully I didn't confuse people too much, but the, the question is, I'm confused about search and match. Don't you also have search as a separate thing in MDM? Lou, do you want to take that one? Or Ray? Either one of you? I'll take that, I'll take that one. Thanks, Lou. So um, it, it's kind of interesting. The, it, in, during the presentation, we talked about search as part of the matching process or the selection of sort of a candidate set or a set of potential matching records before we go and apply those match purposes in order to decide whether or not we do or don't have a match. And while technically that's, that's correct, it is part of that overall matching process and, and can be part of a large batch match exercise. Um, the term search also um, can, can actually apply to um, more of a real-time process, i.e., before I ingest a new person or before I go and, and create a new identity for John Smith, I want to do a real-time search to determine whether or not I already know John Smith. So I need to be able to support a fast, effective, real-time search that overcomes all those errors, variations, typos, misspellings, the things that Leslie was talking about during the presentation. And identity resolution within Informatica is particularly well suited for that. And the reason being is if you look at a lot of those other techniques that Leslie was talking about, most of those rely very heavily on data quality to cleanse and standardize in order to bring things together for those string matching routines to, to actually work. Since Informatica's identity resolution has a knowledge base embedded within it, we can actually overcome all those errors and variations without having to cleanse and standardize them first. And that actually makes it extraordinarily effective at doing a real-time search, not only fast, but accurate. You get the same level of accuracy as you would during your batch match process in a real-time search. And that's what prevents duplicates from creeping into your system in the first place. Back to you, Leslie. Anything? Great. Thanks, Lou. I think that's really important to, to bear in mind. I mean, if you think of uh, many of the places where our MDM or identity resolution or Relate 360 has been used in, in things like uh, border control uh, posts at the point where somebody arrives at the border, uh, the border control ag uh, agents are actually searching using our match engine through either IR or Relate 360 or MDM against those watch lists and to make sure that the people that they're letting in uh, to the country are, are people who uh, they don't want to keep out of the country. So that's something that is a really important use case and, and being able to deal with both the batch as well as the real-time searches is, is important. Thanks, Lou. Um, all right, so we have uh, another question. Um, I think probably this one's for you, Lou, as well. Um, the question is, can I use multiple populations at one, oh, it's a two-part question. Can I use multiple populations at the same time and um, can I, can I, to, sorry, can I do cross-script matching with multiple scripts, e.g. Latin, Kanji, and Cyrillic in one go? Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, and if my voice sounds a little different, it is, it's because that wasn't Lou that answered the last question. But, uh, oh, sorry, I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. uh, the, uh, the, the answer is yes. Uh, you can use multiple populations. Uh, some of our, our, our products have uh, limitations around that, but generally speaking, yes. 
uh, you can use multiple populations, and we have a lot of customers that are doing that, customers such as uh, uh, the home office in the UK, HP in California. Uh, what they do is they get data from different countries, and uh, what they do is they silo them using our different populations for searching. Um, as for cross-script matching, our population handle one native script type at a time. So um, we are able to use one population to search against uh, uh, Japanese data in Japanese and Romanized uh, or, you know, Latin one. Uh, and we have a population that does the same thing for Chinese characters, one for Korean, one for uh, Arabic, et cetera. What we don't have at the moment, and we, we are striving to get this together, is a population that will handle all the multiple character sets at one time. Um, and uh, that is a problem. Uh, but it's something that uh, many of our customers work around by, again, using multiple populations. And if they have a, uh, a record that they're searching for and they want to find it, if it's in Japanese, Korean, uh, Arabic, what they will do is they'll work their application so that it searches against three different uh, uh, data indexes, uh, one in each uh, of those uh, native characters. That makes sense. And actually, if I could just add to that, we see most the most common ones are, for example, Romanized character sets uh, against uh, Japanese and, and um, the simplified Chinese, sorry, traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese, and then also Romanized uh, versions of, of Chinese names. Those are the ones that are most common. We have already dealt with with those, and we have populations that deal with them. You know, as we said, we're looking at. Um, providing additional capabilities there, and that's something that is uh, one of the beauties of what we do is that we have this ability to extend populations and create new ones as well. All right. Um, uh, let's take a quick time just... check. Here. Sorry, Sorry, a quick time check. We have two minutes left. Let's take one more question before we close. All right. Okay. Um, I'll take the the next one then. Um, the next one is what is your AI approach and data matching? Um, so hopefully. You know, as we were, we were talking through this, you, you got the sense that uh, many of the techniques that we have in our match engine are actually using techniques um, and have been for many years that are similar to what we today call AI. Um, you know, and we've been doing that since before AI was a became much uh, such a hyped um, term. Um, so, for example, we're we were analyzing and learning from customer data, things such as and, and using things like decision trees and statistical frequency for the data, um, things like name distribution and nicknames and common aliases already um, are are catered for in our populations. And what we're doing is actually working to bring machine learning into how we automate the feedback cycles to actually customize populations and rules on an ongoing basis using uh, using machine learning for different data. It's the stuff that right now people like Lou and Ray do for us um, when when we need custom populations. So really what we're trying to do is automate a lot of their intelligence back into the, the system directly. Um, anyway, so we have, as I said, just to, to wrap up, um, we have got a lot of those techniques already in the, the match engine. Um, and what we're doing is working to automate more of it, uh, more of the fine tuning of that in, uh, in uh, upcoming releases. All right, so Prasha, I think you said that was the last question that uh, we could take for today. Um, I think we're yeah. we're done then. Yes, I think uh, this has been incredible. Thank you so much, Leslie, for jumping in, and Ray and Lou. I really appreciate you guys taking time for this. Mm -hmm. um, this is really insightful for even me, <laughs> even though I, I hear about these things every day. So thank you so much. Um, and everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I really appreciate you taking time for this as well. Uh, we look forward to the next webinar where hopefully you can join us as well. Um, the, the link was before as I shared. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to another great session with you guys. So thank you so much and have a, have a wonderful day. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, uh, Ray. Thanks, Prash. Bye. Bye.